Steve, I'm grateful to Dr. Uh, Balch for inviting me to the Institute for the Study of Western Civilization. I'm going to be talking, as he said, about poetry. And the uh, title of my talk is Poetry and Truth. It's not a narrow subject, I realize. And I hope you'll forgive the portentousness of my title. But I intend to make my case this evening as a poet and not as a philosopher, receiving thereby a significant demotion in Socrates' rankings in the Phaedrus from first place to sixth out of nine. <laughs> Poets follow such types as household managers, financiers, doctors, and prophets, and outstrip only manual laborers, sophists, and tyrants. <laughs> So rather than attempt to grapple with the nature of truth itself, I'd like to offer some notions about the nature of poetic truth, while bearing a few specific works in mind, beginning in passing with Goethe's autobiography, Aus meinem Leben, Dichtung und Wahrheit, From My Life, Poetry and Truth written between 1811 and 1833. W.H. Auden borrowed Goethe's title in 1959 for a prose sequence on love. And in 1977, the poet Anthony Hecht, a great admirer of both of those other poets, took the same title for a poem in which he considers, among other things, Goethe, the Second World War, and the thorny relationship between truth and art. And I'll say something about Hecht's Dichtung in Wahrheit uh, in another of his poems later in the hour. I realize that I don't have to persuade anyone here associated with the Institute that poetry has greatly enriched Western culture. It's an easy sell, the Iliad, Aeneid, Beowulf, the Divine Comedy, Shakespeare's sonnets and plays, Paradise Lost, it's impossible to imagine our lives, our language, without these keystones of our culture. When we say, his voice was stentorian, or he is to the manner born, or it was sheer pandemonium, we employ just a smattering of the countless words and idioms derived from these works, which are woven into the fabric of our daily talk. And of course, these works routinely speak to one another like cousins sharing news of distant relations at a holiday dinner. One work elusively gossips about another work, a practice to which T.S. Eliot, with his footnote bedizened wasteland and its references to Dante, Shakespeare, Kidd, Nerval, Baudelaire, the Upanishads, etc., is rather a latecomer. So keen is Shakespeare on the story of Dido, Queen of Carthage, for example, that he mentions her four times in The Tempest, twice in Titus Andronicus, and once each in The Merchant of Venice, Henry VI, Part II, Antony and Cleopatra, Hamlet, and Romeo and Juliet. Now, it is likely that Shakespeare borrowed these references to the widow Dido in The Tempest, not from the Aeneid, but from Montaigne's essay of Diverting and Diversions in John Florio's translation of 1603, but this is just a further example of how such references are cross-pollinated and propagated. In fact, as Eliot knew, illusion itself is a great propagator of culture. These fragments I have shored against my ruins, he writes at the end of The Wasteland. The story of Dino for Shakespeare is a liquid bit of cultural currency known to all a story that plays equally well in the upper stalls and down among the oyster shells. Hamlet himself enacts a similar bit of cultural recuperation, recalling for the players Aeneas tale to Dido, quote, the rugged Pyrrhus, he whose sable arms, black as his purpose, did the knight resemble when he lay couched in the ominous horse. From Timaeus, the historian, to Virgil, to Montaigne, to Shakespeare, as stories and references find their way through successive generations of writers, they are revised and revitalized. Illusion, 
someone plucking on the harp. This will come up actually in just a moment in the election. <laughs> Uh, allusion is one of the ways that poems mean. And both of the hecht poems that we will look at in a moment are highly, almost exorbitantly elusive. So we love these great poems for the stories they tell us and for the history they contain. They give important information about who we are as a people, the roots of our customs, our words, our values, and our beliefs. They are roadmaps of our humanity. You will recall what James Joyce said about his novel Ulysses to Frank Budgeon as they were walking together along the Universitätsstrasse in Zurich in 1918. I want to give a picture of Dublin, Joyce said, so complete that if the city one day suddenly disappeared from the earth, it could be reconstructed out of my book. And indeed, the novel follows the Blooms and Daedalus from street to street and from beach to bar to bedroom. But clearly, this kind of information is not all that is being communicated by a work of fiction or poetry. Could be argued that this sort of knowledge, the kind regularly imparted by a newspaper column or a search engine, is almost incidental to the real work of the poem whose ultimate object, I would argue, is the education of the emotions. The poet Mark Strand, who died just this past November, once told Wallace Shawn, uh, the dramatist in a Paris Review interview, that you don't read a poetry for the kind of truth that passes for truth in the workaday world. You don't read a poem to find out how to get to 24th Street. In other words, poetic truth does not inhere ultimately in the denotative language of the poem. For this, we have more effective means of communication, the instruction manual, the brochure, the travel guide, or the, picture, or the public lecture. When Goethe takes poetry and truth as the title of his autobiography, what he is suggesting in part, I think, is that experience in a work of art may be rendered most clearly, and in a sense most truthfully, by attending to something beyond the verifiable facts. Fine, you might say, but doesn't art then become, as Jacques Maritain wrote, a world apart, closed, limited, absolute, not the apprehension of reality, but a replacement for reality, an illusion. This was a moat to trouble the mind's eye of Plato, who will have his say in just a minute. But first I want to offer a definition of poetry put forward by the poet Ivor Winters in his book Primitivism and Decadence in 1937. A poem, Winters wrote, is a statement in words about a human experience. So far, so good, yes? The statement he's quick to add that pays particular attention to the connotative or emotional charge of language. So now we all know where to find the denotative meaning of a word. We go to the dictionary. The connotative shades of a word, however, are harder to locate precisely. Let's take just as an example the word prison. The OED reports originally the condition of being kept in captivity or confinement, forcible deprivation of personal liberty, imprisonment. Hence, now the usual sense, a place of incarceration. Clear, certainly, but a little dry. One could not say that this definition contains the complete meaning of the word. Connotation communicates the emotions associated with a human experience. When we attend to the connotative or associative charge of prison, we think of, say, Edgar Allan Poe's pit and pendulum. A suffocating odor pervaded the prison. I panted, I gasped for breath. Or of Richard II in Pomfret Castle, only moments before his death. I have been studying how I may compare my prison where I live unto the world, and for because the world is populous, and here is not a creature but myself, I cannot do it. Or take Dante's Ugolino, who 
after his children have succumbed one by one to starvation in their shared prison, gives in to his unspeakable hunger. Then fasting, he confesses, had more power than grief. Isolation, deprivation, darkness, threat. Connotation comprises all of the associations, visual, emotional, sonic, that have accrued to a word in all of its uses. The job of the poet is to manage or marshal these emotional charges of language as precisely and as aptly as possible with regard to a human experience. For Winters, poetry, and in its concision, lyric poetry especially, is the highest linguistic form because, taken together, connotation and denotation compose the total content of language. Now, it's true that these two exist together in other forms of writing, in the novel, say, but poetry, by dint of its meters, lines, its highly wrought rhythms, modulates feeling with the greatest control. Connotation in poetry then acquires what Winters thinks of as a moral dimension. In order to render human experience truthfully, connotation or feeling must be precisely managed. As Winters says, the artistic process is one of moral evaluation of human experience by means of a technique which renders possible an evaluation more precise than any other. The poet tries to understand his experience in rational terms to state his understanding and simultaneously to state by means of the feelings we attach to words, the kind and degree of emotion that should properly be motivated by this understanding. The term moral, then, refers, at least in this instance, to a fairly technical process of selecting the best words in the, in the best order for a given subject. Quote, insofar as the rational statement is understandable and acceptable, and insofar as the feeling is properly motivated by the statement, the poem will be good, he tells us. Now, Winter's detractors, who feel that he, in his adherence to reason, quashes emotion in poetry, miss the point, I think. For Winter's, emotion expressed in its proper degree is the whole ballgame. But this question of degree is crucial. If the feeling in a poem is either overstated or understated, the poem falls down. Excessive emotion, a form of sentimentality, obscures the experience under consideration, while the opposite of sentimentality, a kind of cold reportage, can only be a failure, or can also be a failure of moral evaluation. Understatement of the emotion robs experience of its humanity. Take this statement. Three prisoners were publicly executed in a detention center. This crisply relates the facts. But in The Shield of Achilles, Auden affords the reader some inkling of the feelings involved. Barbed wire enclosed an arbitrary spot where board officials lounged. One cracked a joke, and sentries sweated, for the day was hot. A crowd of ordinary, decent folk watched from without, and neither moved nor spoke, as three pale figures were led in and bound to three posts driven upright in the ground. The mass and majesty of this world, all that carries weight and always weighs the same, lay in the hands of others. They were small and could not hope for help, and no help came. What their foes liked to do was done. Their shame was all the worst could wish. They lost their pride and died as men before their bodies died. So we would not expect this sort of account from Anderson Cooper, but we should not accept anything less from our poets. As William Carlos Williams wrote famously, if somewhat blousily, 
in Asphodel, that greeny flower, it is difficult to get the news from poems. Yet men die miserably every day for lack of what is found there. But what exactly is found there? And could one possibly die from the lack of it? One of the things that we find there is song. From ancient times, poetry and music were a single expression. Biblical psalms take their name from the Greek to pull on a stringed instrument. The Greek word musiki is, uh, denotes a combined expression of words, music, and dance. As H.T. Kirby Smith tells us, in the Greek rites, dance movements were coordinated with the audible part of the performance by lifting and clumping down on an enlarged shoe worn by a leader or by raising and lowering of a staff. Poetry and song or incantation or chant often worked together as the basis of religious worship in ancient languages such as Sanskrit, Hebrew, Egyptian, and Greek. In other words, these things were never separate. A dance and a song um, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and words were, were a single expression. Poetry without music is a relatively recent development. A pronounced separation came around 1550, before which, Kirby Smith notes, the concept of a unified performance combining melody, words, and dance never completely <coughs> faded out. The song-like cadence of poetry, in fact, all of prosody or poetic technique, is in itself semantic and carries an emotional charge. It is in the very music of poetry and its meters that it means. Every syllable, every phoneme, is highly ordered in such a way as to communicate feeling. But of course, it's the irrational associates, these irrational associative aspects of song that got the rhapsode ion in trouble with Socrates. A rhapsode means a, it's a stitcher together of songs, but his songs were not his own creation. They were the work of the poet whose lines were divinely inspired. For all good poets comp uh, compose their beautiful poems, Socrates says, not by art, but by inspiration and in a state of possession. And good composers of songs are not in their senses when they write their beautiful songs, but are like Corabantes who are not in their senses when they dance. For a poet is a light and winged and holy creature and cannot make poetry until he is inspired and is out of his senses and his reason is no longer in him. And until this comes to pass, no man can make poems or give forth oracles. For it is not by art that they make their many beautiful poems and speeches about things, but by a divine dispensation, each man can make a beautiful poem, only about the single matter to which the muse inspires him. About all else, he is incapable. Did Plato then really intend to exclude the poets from his polity? It would appear so. We can admit no poetry in our state save hymns to the gods and praises of famous men. For if the muse of pleasure is admitted in epic and in lyric verse, the place of law and of universally accepted reason will be usurped by pleasure and pain. In short, there has always been a quarrel between philosophy and poetry, so that the former judgment of exile passed against poetry is justified by the nature of poetry. And yet, Plato could possibly put up with poets if they could somehow manage to pull their own weight, if poetry could prove not only pleasant, but useful. Unfortunately, he says, poets may know how to make poems, but otherwise they are imitators of phantoms of virtue and of other subjects of their making. Uh, they don't know anything except how to make a poem. They don't know about life, real life. And Homer may not be admit admitted as the great educator of mankind because he carries no moral authority. So the relation of truth to poetry remains fraught to this day. What truths can poetry tell us? And what could its real-world use possibly be? Uh, 
W.H. Auden wrote that poetry makes nothing happen. He understood that no poem had saved a single Jew from death at the hands of the Nazis. Still, he believed in the necessity of action. Poetry, he said, is not concerned with telling people what to do, but with extending our knowledge of good and evil, perhaps making the necessity for action more urgent and its nature more clear, but only leading us to the point where it is possible for us to make a rational moral choice. So in what remains of my time, I'd like to took, uh, take a look at two poems by Anthony Hecht. Uh, the first poem, uh, Dichtung und Wahrheit, begins by juxtaposing a statue with a photo from World War II. And uh, I've been researching Hecht for a biography uh, of him that I'm writing, and in the archive there does exist a photo like the one described here. It's a very specific uh, photo. Uh, so in that sense, it is true, it's documentary. Uh, and I think that bears uh, uh, a little bit on the poem. And you can see Hecht uh, pictured among his, uh, his uh, uh, company. I'll just read the first section. The discus thrower's marble heave captured in mid-career, that polished poise, that parian arm, sleeved only in the air, Vesalian musculature, white as the midwinter moon. This and the clumsy snapshot of an infantry platoon, those grubby and indifferent men lounging in bivouac, their rifles aimless in their laps, stop history in its tracks. We who are all a swim in time, we the inconstant ones, this is a a quote from an Auden uh, poem in praise of limestone, who's a great fan of Auden. We, the inconstant ones, how can such fixture speak to us? The chisel and the lens deal in a taxidermy of our arrested flights, and by their brute translation, we turn into Benthamites. Those soldiers, like some senior class, were they prepared to die? in silver nitrate images behind the camera's eye. It needs a Faust to animate the wan homunculus, construe the stark, unchanging text, winkle the likes of us out of a bleak geology that art has put to rest, and by a sacred discipline, give breath back to the past. How, for example, shall I read the expression on my face among that company of men in that unlikely place. The documentary evidence, the photograph, does not contain the truth of the experience, which remains inscrutable. We rely on art to describe the expression, to give life to that expression, which is lost now. So where does the truth lie? In the world or in the expression? The poem ends, and I'll skip the first half of the second section and um, read the conclusion of the poem with this very question in mind. <clears throat> we begin with the supreme donné, the world, upon which every text is commentary. And yet, they play each other, the oak leaf cured in sodden ditches of autumn darkly confirms our words, and by the frailest trifles, a doubt, a whisper, and a handkerchief, Venetian pearl and onyx are cast away. This is a reference to Othello, of course. It is, in the end, the solitary scholar who returns us to the freshness of the text which returns us to the freshness of the world in which we find ourselves. Like replicas, dazzled by glittering dawns upon a stage, pantelic balconies give on the east, the clouds are scrolled, bellied in apricot, adrift in pools of Scandinavian blue. <coughs> Light crisps the terraces of Dolomite. Enter the prologue, who at once declares 
we begin with the supreme donne, the word. The supreme donne transforms through art from the world to the word until art is as real or more real than the world, a sentiment that recalls Nietzsche's famous line from the birth of tragedy, it is only as an aesthetic phenomenon that existence and the world are eternally justified. Elsewhere in the poem, Hecht suggests that it, it's easy enough to claim in the dawn of hindsight that Mozart's music perfectly enacts pastries and powdered wigs and architecture of white and gold rosettes, balanced uh, parterres. More difficult to know how the spirit learns its scales or the exact dimensions of fear. With this challenge of educating the emotions in mind, how to learn the exact dimensions of fear, how the spirit learns its scales, I want to turn to the next poem, called More Light, More Light. Uh, and I've brought an audio uh, recording of Hecht reading a poem uh, in 1964, which um, we can listen to uh, now. And you have the text in front. A poem which is uh, meant to contrast abruptly and dramatically two executions, one of which took place in Renaissance England and which is a composite of details taken from the deaths of several martyrs, and another one which is an execution described almost exactly accurately uh, that took place in the Buchenwald concentration camp during the Second World War, and the details of which I got from a book by Eugene Kagan, who was himself a prisoner there for five years and was, was then taken to England to help draw up the indictments that were used at the Nuremberg trials. The poem is called More Light, More Light, which purport to be the final words of Goethe on his deathbed. Goethe gets into the poem because prisoners who were taken to Buchenwald by train had to get off at the Weimar railroad station and march the rest of the way to the camp. More light, more light. Composed in the tower before his execution, these moving verses, and being brought at that time painfully to the stake, submitted, declaring thus, I implore my God to witness that I have made no crime. Nor was he forsaken of courage, but the death was horrible, the sack of gunpowder failing to ignite, his legs were blistered sticks on which the black sap bubbled and burst as he howled for the kindly light. And that was but one, and by no means one of the worst, permitted at least his pitiful dignity, and such as were by made prayers in the name of Christ that shall judge all men for his soul's tranquility. We move now to outside a German wood, Three men are there commanded to dig a hole in which the two Jews are ordered to lie down and be buried alive by the third, who is a Pole. Not light from the shrine at Weimar beyond the hill nor light from heaven appeared, but he did refuse. A Luger settled back deeply in its glove. He was ordered to change places with the Jews. Much casual death had drained away their souls. The thick dirt mounted toward the quivering chin. When only the head was exposed, the order came to dig him out again and to get back in. No light, no light in the blue Polish eye. When he finished, a riding boot packed down the earth. The Luger hovered lightly in its glove, he was shot in the belly and in three hours bled to death. No prayers or incense rose up in those hours, which grew to be years, and every day came mute ghosts from the ovens, sifting through crisp air, and settled upon his eyes in a black soot. <clears throat> So in terms of the 
facts of the poem. Uh, as Hecht explains, he was not a witness to this scene at Buchenwald. It was not true for him in that sense. The scene resonates very directly with his own life. Hecht's infantry company was among the liberators of Flossenburg concentration camp, very near Buchenwald. As he later explained in an interview, Flossenburg was both an extermination camp and a slave labor camp, this is Hecht talking now, where prisoners were made to manufacture Messerschmitts at a factory right within the perimeter of the camp. When we arrived, the SS personnel had of course fled. Prisoners were dying at a rate of 500 a day from typhus. Since I had the rudiments of French and German, I was appointed to interview such French prisoners as were well enough to speak in the hope of securing evidence against those who ran the camp. Later, when some of these were captured, I presented them with the charges leveled against them, translating their denials or defenses back into French for the sake of their accusers, in an attempt to get to the bottom of what was done and who was responsible. The place, the suffering, the prisoners' accounts were beyond comprehension. For years after, I would wake shrieking. Uh, and in fact, the testimony that Hecht gathered was then later used at the trials at Dachau. Um, how Hecht managed to preserve his sanity, how he managed to express his anguish to his family at that time, and how he began after the war, the fraught process of recovery, um, which did not um, you know, allow him uh, to be free of um, quite a, a, a bad mental breakdown, treatment by Thorazine, and so uh, with Thorazine. So he was, you know, it, it, was, it was a struggle, um, as it was for men. But how he began to bounce back had a great deal to do with his love of Shakespeare. And as Hecht later told an audience at the Folger Library, Shakespeare Library in Washington, I had to leave college in mid-career to join the army and one of the few talismans I brought with me from civilian life to protect my spirit and sanity from the mindlessness of military training and overseas combat was a little paperback volume of Shakespeare's plays. So in his letters home, Hecht puts on a stoic, even jocular aspect, despite severe and chronic depression. On one occasion, he dashes off a quick postcard to his family with a few lines remembered from As You Like It. Sweet are the uses of adversity, which, like the toad, ugly and venomous, wears yet a precious jewel in his head. There is a marked paucity of jewels in my toad, but I continue to search, he writes. When, in October 1944, Hecht was overcome by a fit of abysmal despair, he wrote to his own mother, Dorothea, the words Hamlet speaks to Gertrude. I have that within me which passeth show, these but the trappings and the suits of woe. And at the end of the war, reading Shakespeare helped bring the traumatized Hecht back to himself. I emerged from the war, he writes, sound, and if not sane, at least not stark raving mad, to no one's astonishment more than my own. And the best index I think I had of the recovery of my balance, my humanity, remember that line, much casual death had drained away their souls? And my most valuable faculties was the gradual recovery of the pleasure of reading Shakespeare. That pleasure has continued and grown richer ever since. I like to believe it has had a subtle and strengthening influence on my own poetry. Of course, that's kind of a laugh because uh, Shakespeare is everywhere in his poetry. Hecht's poetry about the war is filled with these echoes, particularly in poems in his Pulitzer Prize winning collection, The Hard Hours, which includes this poem, More Light, More Light. King Lear, in particular, recurs throughout. In April 1978, he wrote to the critic Ashley Brown that the tragic vision of Lear is actually present in The Hard Hours in the final part of Rites and Ceremonies. He quotes from Lear, none does offend, none I say, none. <coughs> Lear, he tells Brown, also lurks in the interstices of other poems, such as Behold the Lilies of the Field, Bird Watchers of America, perhaps elsewhere, he says. And certainly one could add poems such as 
Third Avenue on, uh, in Sunlight, one of his better known poems, and importantly, More Light, More Light. So King Lear is perhaps the most complete statement of negation that we have in English. Just run through some of the lines in your head. Nothing will come of nothing. Never, 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 never. They could not, would not do it. No, 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 come, let's away to prison. No, no, no life. Like so much of Lear, Heck's poem proceeds through negation. The first no occurs early on in the Elizabethan section, placed in the mouth of the martyr who has made no crime. Then accompanying the first nor comes another echo from Lear. The word howl repeats Lear's howl at the death of Cordelia. The second scene in the poem constitutes a tightly woven pattern of negatives. Goethe's emphatic dying words, more light, more light, become not light from the shrine at Weimar, behind, beyond the hill, nor light from heaven appeared. But he did refuse. A luger settled back deeply in its glove. He was ordered to change places with the Jews. And then two stanzas later, no light, no light in the blue Polish eye. When he finished, a riding boot packed down the earth. The luger hovered lightly in its glove. He was shot in the belly and in three hours bled to death. The final image, again with an echo of Lear, is of sightless eyes. And every day came mute ghosts from the ovens, sifting through crisp air, and settled upon his eyes in a black soot. The survivors of the camps, as Hecht himself witnessed, were naked, skeletal, their yellowed skin stretched over bony frames. As one soldier from C Company reported, many had died with their eyes wide open, staring into space, as if they were seeing over and over again all of the torture the Germans had put them through, their mouths open, gasping for the last breath that might keep them alive. When a prisoner died, one of his fellows would carry his body to the stack of bodies beside the incinerator. The smell, this soldier reported, was unimaginable. Raised in a largely secular household, Heck's experience of Judaism, a source of childhood shame, in a climate of genteel anti-Semitism, changed significantly, profoundly, after the war. Quote, in time I came to feel an awed reverence for what the Jews of Europe had undergone, a sense of marvel at the hideousness of what they had been forced to endure. I came to feel that it was important to be worthy of their sacrifices, to justify my survival in the face of their misery and extinction, and slowly I began to shed my shame at being Jewish. As the poem reminds us through illusion, the scene takes place in the land of Goethe, the great man of Europe, an epitome of German culture, whose house became after his death a shrine for the hordes of his admirers. It was also the land of Heck's own great grandparents. If the poem has a use in the sense that Plato intends, then perhaps it is that those mute ghosts from the ovens are not entirely silenced. Through Heck's poem, they instruct our emotions. To adopt Auden's formulation, they extend our knowledge of good and evil, clarifying the nature of action and leading us to a point where we can make a rational, moral choice. Thank you. Thank you.